Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. I was living in London and working as a management consultant and lived in a big house and had a, a nice little red sports car and a lovely husband who was tall and good looking and successful. And yes, on paper, everything looked exactly as it's supposed to for like an Oxford law graduate in their early 30s. But I felt like there was something more to this life than just having the, the job and the salary and the sports car. And all of these things that were supposed to make me happy just weren't. I was really deeply miserable. And then it, it was even worse that on the surface, everything looked perfect. It was like, now I should be happy, but I'm not. So what's wrong with me? Over the course of the next few years, I managed to sabotage a lot of the things that had been making my life so perfect in quotes. And a couple of years later, my marriage ended. I moved out of the marital home. So at this point, my poor mother was probably having many sleepless nights, wondering where it had all gone wrong. Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And this is is Labyrinths. That was Roz Savage. And today, she holds four Guinness World Records. And thankfully, they're not for the epic self-destruction of her, quote, perfect life. It was sort of existential. Everybody that I knew had jobs like mine, lived in houses like mine, had spouses like mine. And I didn't know what lay outside that London yuppie bubble. Yeah. But I knew that there had to be something and that I had to find it. Yeah, I've had an existential crisis or two myself. Um, And one of those sort of bittersweet things about my own experience is that I had a, quote, good reason in the sense that it was like very obvious that I was going through a crisis. It was this extreme external circumstance. And so one of the sort of upsides of that kind of existential crisis is I don't have to ask myself whether or not I should be having an existential (laughs) crisis. It's fairly obvious, yeah. At the very least, I didn't feel like there was something wrong with me. But what is it like to go through an existential crisis where you don't even know really what to put your finger on that's wrong? It's pretty lonely, actually. Well-meaning friends would say, but look at all the good things that you have in your life. And I go, yeah, I know. I'm an ungrateful cow, aren't I? (laughs) Yikes, you know, what a first world problem. So the way that I managed to find my way out of it was I turned to self-help books and Hmm. good old Stephen Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people and habit number two being begin with the end in mind. And There's an exercise there to imagine your own funeral and you're somehow there in the ether eavesdropping on what people are saying about you. And you write two versions of this scenario in this exercise, the version that you want and the version that you're heading for if you carry on as you are. And I do thoroughly recommend this exercise, but it also comes with a a major government health warning that it could seriously change your life. Um, It could end (laughs) your marriage. It could end your career. It could well cause some upheaval. But sometimes you have to go through that creative destruction. So I, I did this exercise and I can remember how I felt as I imagined what I wanted people to be saying about me. And it was pretty thin on specifics. It was really much more about the energy of who I was, of being someone who lived enthusiastically, just got out there and would try things and not be afraid of failure. And even if it all went to hell, would just put myself up and try again. I just really wanted to have lived adventurously and boldly Hmm. and not be stuck in this gilded cage anymore. And I wanted people to describe me as someone who was a good friend and who did my best to leave the world 
maybe a slightly better place than I found it. And um, looking back on it now from my sort of current spiritual worldview, I would say it was almost like I'd sat down with my soul and said, so what did you come here for? Hmm. Like, what was your purpose in this life? And it was as if my soul said, oh, thank God, I thought you'd never ask. And I was just about to, <laughs> to expire in that soul crushing job you've been doing for the last 11 years. It was a real eye opener. But it didn't lead to immediate change because I was so invested in the life that I was living. Yeah. You know, I was, I was married and I had a mortgage and all of these good reasons to keep things exactly as they are. But um, and you have momentum. I think that's something that a lot of people underestimate is the power of momentum. There's a, a cognitive bias that um, is really common, the sunk cost fallacy, oh, where yeah. we think I've already put so much into this life that I've been living. What am I going to lose by just throwing that all away and turning into a new direction. And I'm not a 20-year-old spring chicken with nothing to lose anymore. Absolutely. And in fact, there's another cognitive bias that I, I don't know the name of it, but we have this, if things go badly, we would prefer that things went badly because we didn't change than because we made a proactive change and then it screwed up. Mm. because then that gives us more to beat ourselves up about. Right. Whereas if we sort of just maintain the status quo and things go sideways, then we're like, oh, shit happens. That's just yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it was scary to realize that I was so off track for the kind of life that I wanted to have. And I think a lot of people end up living their whole lives pursuing that sunk cost fallacy. And I love it that we're talking about cognitive biases and fallacies, because I think they account for so much of the strangeness that is the human condition. So, uh, again, this with hindsight bias, right. <laughs> the, my interpretation <laughs> of it now is that once I had seen that life that I wanted to be living, I couldn't unsee it. Hmm. That something was going to have to change. Although at the time I was like, oh my God, like this is dynamite. I, I can't act on this. So I just put it away in a drawer and try to forget all about what I'd just written. But over the course of the next few years, I managed to sabotage a lot of the things that had been making my life so perfect in quotes, but actually had been holding me back from really fully being myself. Mm. So um, I quit my job and a couple of years later, my marriage ended, meaning I moved out of the marital home. So at this point, my poor mother was probably having many sleepless nights, wondering where it had all gone wrong. But actually, it was incredibly liberating because I think that kind of material success can be a real trap when we have the respect of our peers and they're like, wow, your life is looking so great and you're succeeding by all the conventional metrics of our Western again, air quote, civilization. Right. <laughs> um, and to realize that you can just blow all of that up and actually feel happier for it. Because I think there's something else that happens when we sort of get off the treadmill and start pursuing our soul's path. I hope people aren't too uncomfortable with that sort of spiritual language, but that's really what it feels like to me. That when I felt like I came into alignment with my own nature, the most wonderful people started showing up in my life. Mm. I discovered who was hanging out outside of the London yuppie bubble. I'm not saying that the people inside that bubble weren't cool. They, they were lovely and many of them are still friends. But people who were living very different lifestyles showed up like allies and mentors if this was the hero's journey. And I felt so supported and encouraged. And life really started to feel magical. Hmm. It felt like things just showed up when I needed them. Hmm. As soon as I had a question, uh, I would find an answer from a conversation or from a book. I suppose when you're looking for the messages, they start to show up. That's great. Because I think one of the things that people 
anticipate and that hold them back from making a change is that sense of uncertainty of, well, I don't even know what I'm steering towards yet. So how do I take those steps? At least I know what I know here in this place where I'm at. How do you confront that obstacle of feeling lost in the transition? Yeah, the ego mind really prefers what's familiar. <laughs> um, and so maybe use an example that for you might be a little bit too close to home. But if people have been incarcerated for a long time, they can struggle on the outside because it's so different. Yep. And, you know, the ego's job is to keep us safe, keep us alive. And so it doesn't like us to try anything too radically new and different because it might kill us. Whereas the things that we've done in the past clearly have not killed us. So it's always going to default back to the familiar. I'm actually very grateful that more by accident than by design, I did sabotage the status quo, hmm. the security of the job and the marriage. And so I did end up in free fall and life rose to catch me. Hmm. Because when you've taken that leap of faith and it goes okay, you're like, what are the other things that I might be able to do that have previously terrified me? I was 34. Five when this was happening. And it really felt like for the first time in my life, I was learning how to fly hmm. and trusting that all would be okay. And what did that look like? What were you doing? So that time, I call it my happy dabbling phase because I still had no idea who I was. I knew who I wasn't and I'd rejected and moved on from all of that. But I still didn't know what I was trying to move towards. So I tried out various different careers. I was a photographer. I traveled around Peru and wrote a book about my travels. I was an organic baker for a bit. Then I was going to create the next big coffee shop chain. You know, <laughs> this was actually before there was a coffee shop on every single corner. Oh, it was going to be a motorcycle career as well, but I failed my test for going too fast. <laughs> um, so I was just trying on all of these different coats. It was like, oh, let's try on a new career, see if this one fits. And none of them quite fitted, but I did learn something from every single one of those experiences about what I enjoyed and what I didn't enjoy. Mm. And that all fed into the mix. So I mentioned that I spent some time in Peru. Um, this was back in 2003. And while I was there, I became aware of the retreating glaciers up in the Andes. I was on a pilgrimage um, in the, the mountains outside Cusco. And uh, my fellow pilgrims told me that this glacier that they trek up to is, is getting smaller every year. And I hadn't really wised up to climate change. I think we've come a very long way in the last 20 years in terms of awareness. And so when I got back to England, I did some research and it was just a revelation to me. And I really felt like I desperately wanted to do something to raise awareness of our environmental issues. But I didn't know what. I had the purpose, but not the project. And so for about six months, I was desperately trying to find this project and just wasn't finding anything that seemed to fit. And you know how you often have your best ideas when you're not thinking about anything at all? Sure. I love Elizabeth Gilbert's idea that these ideas just wander around in the ether looking for some human being whose guard is down. <laughs> <laughs> and then they just like grab hold of you and they don't let go until you say yes. I did have a number of criteria for whatever this project was going to be. It had to be environmentally low impact, had to be sufficiently unusual to catch people's attention, had to be something that would help me to grow as a person. And I was very into travel and adventure at this point. And I was also quite fit at that stage of my life. And I was on this long drive. This crazy idea saw its opportunity and swooped in and grabbed me and wouldn't let go. And um, I think I knew immediately in my heart that it was exactly what I'd been looking for. Mm. The heads took a little bit longer to come round to it again, that uh, self-preserving ego mind was like, no, this is a horrible idea. <laughs> that idea was to row across the Atlantic Ocean by herself. She did not own a boat or have ocean rowing experience or even really know what she was getting herself into. After about a week of debating it back and forth, I decided I was going to make it happen and drew up a very big long list one of the benefits of being a management consultant so long is that I'm really good at Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> so I did my Excel spreadsheet with a big list of 
all of the things that I would need to do if I was going to make it a reality to row across oceans to raise awareness for our environmental issues and looked down this long list and yeah there were a lot of items on it but I'd broken it down to such a fine level of detail that nothing on there looked too intimidating hmm. and it started to seem dangerously possible ha. so yeah that was it <laughs> I mean, that's just a skill in and of itself, being able to break down a seemingly impossible task into a series of entirely possible tasks. Yeah, it's actually something that I still use when I feel a bit daunted by something like just what's the next one thing that I need to do? Is it to send an email? Is it to pick up the phone and call somebody? Is it as simple as just doing a Google search on something just to start building a bit of momentum? It's such a cliche, but the first step is always the hardest one. And then once you've taken one step, even if it's in completely the wrong direction, you just start to feel your way into it. And that's when it starts to get kind of exciting. That's when I start to get really carried away. <laughs> We could give you lots of reasons to support Labyrinths on Patreon, including ad-free episodes and exclusive patron-only content. But why not hear it direct from a listener? My name is Henry, and I've been a supporter of the Labyrinths podcast for some time. I can totally relate to the concept of feeling lost, and I think the stories have helped me tremendously getting through these last couple of years, and I think they would help others as well. Visit patreon.com slash Robinson. The preparation was really full on. Um, I signed up to do the Atlantic Rowing Race 2005, and it was September 2004 when I signed up for it. So that gave me 14 months to get ready as a solo rower. And that's really not very long to get a boat, get it all fitted out, do all the physical training, acquire all the skills around first aid at sea and meteorology and reading maritime charts and all of this stuff. And I'm actually very grateful that I just had to go in 100% hell for leather because it didn't give me too much time to go, hmm, is this really a good idea? Because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we so often talk ourselves out of things. I mean, people think that I'm really tenacious and committed because I've done all this rowing. And yes, I did really commit to that. But there have been so many projects that I've started and not seen through. Um, I mean, just ask my mum. When I told my mum about the rowing, she was like, oh, I, I just hope it's going to be another one of those projects that Rosalind gets all excited about and then gives up on partway through. <laughs> but unfortunately for her, it wasn't. I really got the bit between my teeth on this one. So I think we often defeat ourselves. Hmm before we get to the realization of our dream. We get scared, that ego mind kicks back in again. We start worrying about what other people are gonna think about us, whether they're gonna think we're crazy or foolish or whatever. Money worries can undermine the most ambitious and beautiful of dreams. But I was very meticulous in my preparation. It helped to give me the illusion that I was vaguely in control of this project. Things like to work out how many calories I was going to need. So I catalogued everything that I ate, broke it down by fat, protein, carbohydrate, fiber, meticulously recorded every bit of exercise that I did, trained like a maniac. It just gave me the sense of progress towards the goal. And I thought that it got me well prepared for the Atlantic. As it turns out, not so much. <laughs> but you don't need enough courage to get to the far side of an ocean. You just need enough courage to get past the point of no return, mm. which <laughs> in terms of ocean rowing is not very far out into the ocean because the winds and the currents are pretty much a, a one-way street. Wow. And so once you're a few days out, in my case, from the Canaries, just off the coast of Africa, it's going to be really, really hard to get back to land you pretty much um, may as well just keep on going. Well, tell me about that. What, what are these highs and lows of your journey? And I'm not just talking about the waves. <laughs> <laughs> the Atlantic was 
crazy. Um, it was 2005, year of Hurricane Katrina, Rita Wilma. There were 28 named storms. I didn't run into any of the really massive storms, but it was just a very rough and generally stormy year on the Atlantic. All four of my oars broke before I got halfway across, just due to the pressure of the water, usually during semi-capsizes of the boat while the I was in the cabin and the oars were stowed. The camping stove broke, my music broke, so I was alone with my own thoughts the whole way across, Wow! which ended up being a voyage of three and a half months. And I don't think I could have imagined that in advance, just being alone in my own head for three and a half months. It was absolutely brutal. I felt like I'd already come a long way in terms of dealing with my insecurities, but boy, <laughs> they came back with a vengeance. Um, it was really hard, but very character building. There wasn't a single day when I didn't think, why the hell did this ever seem like a good idea? Mm. But I suppose I'd wanted to find out what I was capable of. And I found out that I'm capable of far more than I would ever have thought. And I'm not special in that. I honestly think that we're all capable of far more than we think we are, especially when we've put ourselves in that position where you really have no choice but to just keep on going. But it's lucky for me that it's very hard to quit in the middle of an ocean. Right. Like, what's she going to do? You just have to. <laughs> I could have called for a ship to come and pick me up, but then I'd have hmm. had to abandon my boat and I'd invested so much emotionally, financially, just in every possible way into making this a success. I was like, I am not going back to that office. <laughs> I have to make this work. <laughs> so I, I hung on in there by my fingernails, but it was beyond challenging. I'm sure that when you were incarcerated, you also found yourself going to some dark places and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And you start getting really fearful of your own imaginings about what might happen. And that is something really helpful that I learned, that most of my fears I've just made up. Hmm. Normally when something really bad was happening on the boat, I was too busy dealing with it to actually get scared about it. Hmm. It's when you're just left alone with your own imaginings that things get really hard. So now if I find myself getting fearful, um, then I, I just just do something, <laughs> like anything. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Like if you're in the middle of a crisis and you have to do something, at the very least, you're distracted with a sense of very determined purpose. Yeah. It's when that stillness comes around that you have the opportunity to sit and reflect on what it all means to you that you can enter into the psychological crisis. Absolutely. Yeah. Was it John Milton who said, I'm paraphrasing, but the mind's the world unto itself. It can make its own heaven or it can make its own hell. And yeah, I definitely gave myself hell at many times mm. on that crossing. How did you know that you weren't on just another treadmill? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> Once when I was at a speaking event, someone said, so you used to sit there in the office hating every moment. So now you're sitting in a rowboat hating every moment. So really what's changed, except now you're not getting paid for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, good point. <laughs> I think it really, really helped that I had this massive motivation. For me personally, I think it really helps to have at least two levels of motivation. So I had this environmental mission. Um, so I felt like I was connected to some purpose that was bigger than just my little self. And then there was also a very deeply personal mission to find out who I was and what I was capable of. It was almost like this process of creating a new self, or stroke by or stroke. Mm. And for a lot of the time out there, I did just feel like a failed management consultant who was desperately trying to reinvent herself. But then towards the end, there was um, oh, a particular challenge that really scared me. I was really close to the end. and Oh, God, it had been so hard. I was so desperate to reach dry land. And I was close enough. I could almost smell it. <laughs> and then the winds changed. And 
an ocean rowboat is a really big, bulky thing. It's um, 23 feet long, six feet wide. You can't row into a headwind. So what you do when you're in an ocean rowboat and you've got a headwind, you put out a sea anchor, like a big parachute on a rope that goes out underneath the water and grabs hold of a ton of seawater and stops you being blown too far backwards. And you wait for the wind to change. So after... 24 hours or so of waiting, finally the wind changed. I go to pull the sea anchor back in and it's supposed to have a trip line that collapses the chute, like closing an umbrella to dump all the seawater out of it so you can pull it back on board. But somehow the trip line had got wrapped around the the main line so I couldn't dump the water out the chute. So I'm in this tug of war with a ton of seawater and I'm clearly losing and I'm, I'm just skinning the palms of my hands as I'm pulling on this rope. Well, crap, now what do I do? Because the sea anchor, meanwhile, is pulling me in the wrong direction, not backwards, but sideways. I'm trying to get to Antigua and it's pulling me towards Barbados. And so eventually I thought, well, I'm just going to have to cut away the sea anchor. I've just got to get out there with a, a knife and cut the rope. But it was really, really rough conditions. And there'd been another crew near there not long before that had been really stressed out because the shark was just banging against the hull of their boat and they ended up quitting <sighs> and so I was like ah sharks big waves I don't want to have to go out over the front of the boat because also it's a curved cabin I'm like how am I going to hang on to it so I was like okay if I was a proper adventurer what would I do now <laughs> <laughs> okay I would set up a safety line across the front cabin of the boat so I managed to lasso a cleat on the front of the boat and I set up this safety line and I clip myself onto it and put this knife between my teeth and I climb out over the front of the boat and I did slide off but the line stopped me actually falling into the ocean and losing the boat and I cut away the sea anchor and I get back on the boat and I'm just like yes I did it <laughs> I am an adventurer <laughs> I am no longer just a bird management consultant I mean it sounds a bit ridiculous but for me at the time it was a real triumph I really started to own my new identity at that point mm. it's like yes I am an ocean rower and um, I have carried a knife between my teeth above <laughs> the waves and the sharks <laughs> like I'm basically a pirate. What are you all talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think we always have like this little inner observer that's telling us a story about who we are. And I know that when I set out on the Atlantic, certainly my inner observer was going, what the hell? Like, What's she doing? She's not qualified to do this. And it, it was freaking out pretty much every day on the way across. But when you do something that scares you and it doesn't kill you, <laughs> it disrupts your narrative. And all of those self-limiting beliefs about what you are and what you're not. You just have to keep proving it to yourself until it really becomes integrated. So when I finished the Atlantic, I knew I'd learned a hell of a lot. It was definitely the most intense crash course in personal development that anybody, I think, could ever go through. And it was almost too much for me to absorb it all as I was going. So it really helped me then to write the book about it and to give keynotes about it, to hear my voice or see the words, reinforcing not just the overall narrative, but the, the lessons that I learned along the way until they really just became part of who I am every day. But of course, I've still got my hang ups and insecurities and fears because that's part of being human. But I have a lot of coping strategies to deal with them now. Mm. And I can also just always draw on that experience and go, look, I've done hard things before and I've got through them. I know that I can do this. It's sort of like that growth mindset part mm -hmm. of I may not know the answer, but I, I have a, a strategy. Mm. So let's try the strategy and see if it works. Mm -hmm. So that, I suppose, has been the real gift of doing something that challenged me beyond what I thought was possible, mm. that you've then got that as a, as a resource to go, yes. I, I call it the gift of hard times during the, the pandemic. You know, so many people's lives have been disrupted in ways that might seem really negative. People have lost their livelihoods or lost loved ones. Um, there's been a loss of struggle. But I do hope that if there is anything positive to extract from this, then it might be that people could say, well, I survived the pandemic. So in the future, when 
challenges come along, they've got that that knowledge to draw on. Yeah. And, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the challenges that we have to face and the challenges that we choose to face. When I think about self-definition and the stories that we tell about ourselves and that other people tell ab about us. I think one of the fears is that we want to have a voice in our own narratives. We want to have an authoritative voice about who we are and what our life means. And we don't always have control over that. And a lot of times we're just kind of reacting to what life is giving us. And it's so liberating to choose a challenge instead of just reacting to the challenges that life is giving us. Do you feel the same way? I was very fortunate that I got to choose my challenges, that's for sure. And I may not always be so lucky. Roz Savage didn't stop at the Atlantic. High on the success of that first big challenge, she set her sights even higher. Perhaps too high? My first attempt on the Pacific Ocean ended in complete failure and humiliation. Um, I got 10 days out from the coast of California and weather forecasts are really not reliable for more than about seven days out. So I took the best window I could, but I ran into a big storm about 10 days out. And my boat was capsizing really more than it should have been. The boats are designed to self-right if they capsize, but it just felt a bit off. And I lost my sea anchor, which is a very important piece of equipment. And long story short, I probably wouldn't have asked for rescue, but somebody was concerned about me and sent out the Coast Guard to, to come and get me. And so I ended up being airlifted into a Coast Guard helicopter and having to abandon my boat. And <laughs> unluckily for me, Twitter and Facebook had just been invented. Great timing. And people had opinions about my sanity, about my competence, about my professionalism. And it was really hard to be on the receiving end of these narratives that didn't fit with my perception of myself. And I'm guessing that you know what that's like. And I had to find a way to cope with that. I was feeling very misunderstood and I wanted to put the record straight, but I just had to accept that people will have their narratives. Even people who love me have stories about me that are not necessarily who I am. Maybe even some of my stories about who I am aren't actually true. And I also had to tell myself, well, heck, my complete and utter failure on this occasion makes these people feel better for never having tried. There they mm. are, sitting on their sofas, tapping on their keyboards. It's very easy to be an armchair critic, but it's harder to be the one out there in the arena um, trying to do something good. And yes, it's not always going to go well. So I developed a much thicker skin and told myself that actually, all the criticism said much more about the critics than it did about me. Yeah. Because people project, don't they? They'll project their stuff onto whoever's in the news for whatever reason. And I just wonder what it's like to be a president or a royal. They get so much projection onto them. So I just had to learn not to take it personally. Yeah. But it's yeah, hard. I, I it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when people want to like stuff you into a little box in their mind and yeah. and get mad at you for existing outside of it. It can be challenging. Well, that's another reason that change is so hard is that people around us, no matter how much they love us, can get quite uncomfortable when we do something that challenges their narrative about who we are. I mean, isn't it such a marvelous gift when somebody really sees you for who you are, not for who you were or who they want you to be. But it's quite rare. And it's sort of the brain's fault. The brain likes its stories because it saves it time. It's just like, oh, yeah, that's Bob. Yeah, he's like, boom, boom, boom. Here's my caricature of him. But it's not right. really him. I think you're right. It's not even malicious. It's just a sort of natural 
cognitive bias that we have where we fit people into these very neat little roles and we get confused and scared even when people do not act the way that we expect them to. And we usually attribute some kind of negative reason for them acting in a different way than we expect. Yeah. It's fascinating. There's a, a story about the people who have the opposite view around anything, abortion yeah. <laughs> or climate change or wh whatever, pick your particular culture war. But then when you actually meet a person as an individual, not just as a faceless member of them, then it can really disrupt that story. It's like, damn, I had a story that you're going to be an evil person, <laughs> practically with horns and a forked tail. And gosh, I actually find out that 99% you want the same things that I do. Mm -hmm. And it takes a bit of effort to be willing to go into a bit more depth and a bit more nuance and not just stick somebody in a box and think that you know them. The challenge of the public shaming Roz faced only encouraged her to keep trying. And shortly after that aborted attempt to row solo across the Pacific, she tried again and succeeded. She now holds four Guinness World Records for ocean rowing, most notably that she is the first woman to row solo across three oceans, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian. She spent nearly 500 days of her life at sea, taking over 5 million oar strokes covering over 15,000 miles, all in a 23-foot rowboat. In light of her accomplishments, she was named a United Nations Climate Hero, a Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, and Adventurer of the Year by National Geographic in 2010. I've got a new book coming out in November, which I'm really excited about. I've got a couple of books out there already, mostly about rowing. <laughs> this one is more about my journey of learning over the last 20 years as wannabe environmental agent for change, but realizing that change is difficult, both individually and collectively. I was so naive when I started out. When I became aware of the environmental crisis, I thought, well, clearly people don't know, because if they did know, they'd be behaving differently. And if I just tell them, then everything <laughs> will change. And obviously, it doesn't work that way, because the way that humans relate to the environment is affected by our economic model, and that's interrelated with our political model. And then that relates to our power structures. And then it's also influenced by our psychology and our cognitive biases and our neuroscience. And there are all of these factors that perpetuate the status quo. So I explore those and conclude that what we basically need, not just to solve our ecological challenges, but all our social challenges as well, is really a shift in consciousness to deeply understand that everything and everybody is connected. Hmm. And now that there are nearly 8 billion of us on the planet, it's fairly obvious that everything that we do impacts on other people. We're not living in isolated little communities. We're online, we're communicating. Everything we do has, has consequences. And so the book gets a bit metaphysical towards the end. And in the final section, a vision of a, a bold new future where we actually are creating a new civilization based on a very different set of values of evolution and collaboration and connection and compassion, hmm. where until we're all OK, nobody's OK. Hmm. So I had a lot of fun with that as a thought experiment. What's your book called? It's called uh, The Ocean in a Drop. And it's from the Rumi quote about you're not just a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Hmm. And it's about how we do all make a difference. Not just we can all make a difference, but we are already making a difference. It's just that often it's not a conscious difference. Hmm. Whereas when we get more intentional about the kind of difference that we're making, that's when the magic starts to happen. Hmm. So that's very much on my mind at the moment. And I'm also exploring how business can be a real force for positive change in the world, hmm. and also the rebalancing of the feminine and the masculine. And this isn't about men and women, but it's much more about we do have a very yang, very doing, very proactive, energetic, let's hurtle on with progress regardless kind of a culture in our Western world anyway. And 
I think for us to come back into balance with each other and with Earth, we need to have a bit more yin, the feminine, the the pausing, the contemplating whether just because we can do something, whether we should do it. Mm-hmm. So even though masculine and feminine is not about men and women, I do think maybe women have a little bit of a head start in bringing in more of that precautionary principle, bringing in more compassion, bringing in more equality, but also male allies, very welcome. Hmm. So since I got out of the boat 11 years ago, I've remained obsessed by how does change happen? Why does it fail to happen? How can we find strategies to help us make positive change. And I hesitate to say that because we're sort of living in the sum total of unintended consequences. <laughs> it seems like most of the changes that humanity has tried to make, we've had really good intentions and it doesn't always pan out quite that way. Right. Which is why I think rather than going in large, we need to have little pilots of new ways of doing things see how it goes, get some feedback, wait a little while to see what the consequences are. Just take a more holistic, long-term view of the things that we do. Hmm. And it's challenging because the economics don't really encourage that perspective. Yeah. The economics encourage growth, rapid growth, grow it big and sell out fast. I remember having a really nice conversation with a friend of mine. We were talking about what the opposite of productivity is. Mm -hmm. And there's this feeling in our culture that you have to be productive or else you're just being passive and you have all these sort of like, if you're not being productive, then you're being anti-productive, which is not good. And we were instead trying to think, well, but is that really the opposite of productivity or is the opposite of productivity receptivity and reflection? Mm. Is it receiving and reflecting on what it is that we have spent so much time producing? Is it really understanding and listening to what the consequences of our actions are so that we cannot just perpetuate unintended consequences that we don't want? Yeah, what a beautiful inquiry. Yeah, I'm going to say something desperately unfashionable and countercultural now. You know, in nature, we see cycles, we see seasons uh, of the year, we see day and night. There is up and there is down. And that has been the way of things for as long as the earth, probably the universe, has existed. And so, as well as the receptivity, I think there might even be the composting. We haven't really seen a period probably since the Dark Ages, and I'm certainly not advocating going back to the Dark Ages. Um, you know, you will prize Nothing my like iPhone. Nothing like a good plague. My, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there, there are times when things fall apart. I suppose mm. a very Buddhist philosophy, that things grow and expand, and then things fall apart and contract. And in our Western world, it seems like we often want infinite growth and never ending summer and daylight all day round. And I don't feel like that's a sustainable model. Believe me, I wish it was. Wouldn't that be lovely? But um, when I look at how much the world has changed in my lifetime, I'm 54 now, the human population has way more than doubled. I don't have a crystal ball, but I think there are going to be some learning opportunities for humanity in the years ahead. Mm. I think there need to be. Mm. We've had spectacular successes. And I love technology. I love modern dentistry, modern medicine. But we just need to come back into balance. And we could do that the easy way or we could do it the hard way. And at the moment, it doesn't look like we're going to do it the easy way. Mm. So I think there might be a bit of an existential slap around the head from Mother Nature at some point. Oh, as if we haven't had enough of that the last two years. But <laughs> but hey, gifts of hard times. I, I realize that might not be something that people want to hear, but that's what I'm feeling. And um, 
again, with my sort of Buddhist sensibilities, we tend to label things as good or bad. But certainly in my experience, the times that have sucked the most have been my greatest teachers. Hmm. I've grown the most as a person during the bits that I really didn't enjoy. And I'm absolutely certain I wasn't grateful for those learning opportunities at the time. But in retrospect, I am grateful for them. So if people are sort of feeling real resistance to that, I totally get it. I really do. And um, change is hard. And especially when it's change that feels like a loss. Hmm. But in my experience, every loss, holds the seed of a gain. It's like the yin-yang symbol. The black has the little white dot and the white has a little black dot. Hmm. Every good thing holds the seeds of its destruction and every hard time holds the seed of the next good thing. Hmm. The wheel just keeps turning. Love that. I really just want to leave people with the thought that no matter what the future does hold, there's so much to be grateful for in this world. And when I was out on the ocean with such a simple life, no TV, um, at times no satellite phone either, I just really developed this gratitude and this appreciation of sunrises and sunsets, Mm. of the colour of the ocean, of visits from wildlife, from dolphins and whales and even the sharks. (laughs) For me, my daily walk in the woods here uh, where I live is such a sanity saver. And I think if there are more pandemics or goodness knows what the future holds, just Keeping that connection with nature and and being grateful for it is, for me, just um, a really beautiful daily practice. I think it helps to keep us grounded and helps us keep our wits about us. You can find Roz at her website, rozsavage.com. If people want to get in touch with me, I I love to hear from people. Even if you're mad at me, that's fine too. It's all feedback. (laughs) And in the meantime... Get lost with us. Find us on Twitter, at Amanda Knox. At Man Under Bridge. You can also get in touch with us at knoxrobinson.com. And if you want a challenge you can tackle in less than a minute, please row on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. This episode was written, edited, and sound designed by us, with additional editing and sound design by Josh Thane and theme music by Josh Budo Karp. In the Labyrinth's podcast system, the listener is serenaded by two separate but equally important hosts, Amanda Knox, who brings authenticity and empathy, and Christopher Robinson, who brings intellectual curiosity. These are their stories. What do you think, Knox? Looks like a podcast junkie shot up with one too many ads. Should have become a patron from the looks of it. Who wouldn't prefer ad-free episodes and signed books and live video hangouts over overdosing on ads in an alleyway? Don't patronize me, Knox. Leave that to the listener. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson.